is Karen. But thank you for hosting this and keeping this tradition alive. Well, I hope to make it worth everybody's time. So after that demise of that dream, uh, I was a, a lady was asking me to be a precinct committee person. I said, what does it take? And she was kind of describing you know, your little duties and stuff. And, and then you get to meet politicians and, and learn what they're doing and pass it around the neighborhood and get people to be involved. And it was very esoteric and very uplifting. And, and I said, that sounds like a lot of work. You might as well run for office. She goes, there's an opening. Stan Barnes is moving from the House to the Senate, and there'll be an opening. I said, well, is anybody else running? Yeah, there's five, five people running. And I said, what do you have? You got to get 500 signatures, 480. And when are they do? Uh, the end of next Friday. She goes, you know, I dare you to do it. I said, but, but you dare me to do it? She goes, I dare you to do it. I said, okay. And so I did. And I've got 100 friends. We passed out a, a petition, 10 on a petition. We gathered 900 something signatures in a week and a half. And I ran, and unfortunately for the state of Arizona, for you, I was successful. <laughs> and, and, uh, and it has been, so are we kind of uniformly poli-sci in the room? A hard, a hard group? I, I'll start out with the pitch that you've heard everybody say we need good people in government. That's a total fact. You do. We need good people in government. And what does that mean? And that's why one of the things that we're talking about today. So, I'm in Mexico. I've taken some of your alumni. We've gone down to Peña Manda Taromara. We're on our way home. My suburban runs out of oil. Clack, 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 clack. And I have a trailer and I have a case of oil. And I went back and checked through it. And they're all empty. And it was in the middle of the night. We were about 15 miles shy of Columbus, New Mexico, Palomas, uh, and on our side, and it's like one in the morning, and I passed an Entronquia um, uh, fork in the road that had a Pemex, and so I said, I'm gonna walk back there and get us some more. So we started, and first I was gonna hitchhike, and the first car blew me off, and the second car stopped, and did anybody see the movie Bullet? The bad guy's roadrunner in that car, the uh, Dukes of Hazard, that car. And, and they, there they were, the Dukes of Hazard. They were, they were ethnically Mexican. And they, when I slid in, it's a two-door, I slid in the back seat on long neck beer bottles. And I thought, I'm in trouble. And I remember the heiress, an improvement era, that dates me. A, a Marine coming home with some drunks and got in a rack and the spirit told him, you know, duffel bag on top, get down around the differential and you know, make yourself comfortable. And he lived through the crash. And this was scary. And we went down to the Pemex and it was closed. And one of them kicked in the door. And I thought, oh great, now I'm an accomplice. <laughs> and there was somebody inside, a young man, and he was scared stiff. And I just emptied my wallet, because it's, you'll see there's, there's a little left. But, and paid for that, and I thanked him so much. I was going to walk back to the car, and he said, no, we'll, we'll take you back. And I said, no, no, it's okay. There's two of them. They said, no, we'll take you back. And I said, no, really, you've been very kind. I said, we will take you back. <laughs> so I slid in all the, the empties, and they didn't take me back. They kept going south. And after a period of time, they pulled off the road down in the dark, and I was praying, please, please, Bless my wife and my kids and help my boys to go on missions. And if it's thy will to help me out of this. And they sat smoking for a while. And then a car pulled in front of us and the lights off and another one and another two in behind us. And a guy walked up to the driver and said, Have you seen the patrulla? Have you seen the, the military patrols? And, and he said, Payal, and he thumbs over his back. At me, and he shines a flashlight. He goes, What are you doing with that Camacho in the back seat? Get out of the car. And they blow up, and he drags the guy out, and he's yelling, and the guy takes his place, and the guy climbs in with me, and he's smoking and blowing his cigarette on me. And, and I'm talking, Man, it's a beautiful night, and look at the stars, it's so nice out, and everybody's quiet. And it was the I, the guy on the passenger side, 
looking back at me holding a cigarette. It's completely dark and just residual from stars. And the ember light from his cigarette shining on his, the curve of his eye, that red crescent, looking at me. And a, a vision that I will never forget. And out of a, I hear the man telling him, you will take him out and get rid of him right now. Go get rid of him right now. And so he climbs back in the car, and this guy stays, and, and, uh, and the guy next to me says, well, you might as well have your cigarette. And I said, I'm sorry, I, I don't smoke. He said, why not? I said, it's against my religion. It's just like that, quiet. It's against your religion to smoke. I said, yes. What religion is that? I said, well, people call us Mormons, and uh, it's part of our faith that we don't, we don't smoke. And I'm sorry, I'll, I'll do this there, but I don't smoke. Dead quiet. And then the driver says, I used to be a Mormon. And I thought, what does that mean? <laughs> This is not Sunday school. Obviously, smuggling operations are part of the curriculum from Paul's you know. <laughs> What does that mean? I'm taking him back, and the guy back in the room with me says, What? I said, I said, I'm taking him back. Get out. What? He says, Get out. So the guy climbs out, and then things fall and goes out. And he fires up that Hemi 440 and just burns the tires off. And I was back very quickly. And he said, get out on my side. And as I pushed forward to lean, he said, you know, a little triangle window, you have to lean against the driver. His face is right in and turns and says, put that oil in your car and get out of here. And I said, I sure will, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and so I put one liter in. I thought, 15 miles, if you make it, I'm a liter, you know. I put in a leader, and, and uh, I have thought many times the, end, the question that you, I saw in my poster, boy, that guy was upset in that poster, but um, I says, why? Why did that happen? What is the coincidence that put that person in that driver's seat that night, was told to get rid of me, and decided to give me my life? Why does that happen? A, I don't believe in coincidence. And I don't have to go any farther than the end of your finger. Okay, all you sci any scientists, hope you're all, all the science and he's gonna get this wrong. Okay, you don't call me home. Okay, we're biologists, end of your fingers, 10 million cells. Each cell has 10 million enzymes functioning for the function of the cell directed by the genes, you know, all the genetic stuff. And each enzyme has an associated chaperone molecule that helps it fold in just a certain way so that it, in concert with the other 10 million enzymes in one cell, all do the right thing over and over and over and over again. And that that gene, per Dr. Marquoth, 19, C, 2015 Journal of Science, says that the current estimate for the integrity of the gene, anybody know? used to be three million years, a billion years that death, life, death, life, death, life, iterations of the evolution where out of the primordial swamp this sluggish thing comes up and turns into a BYU student and is walking around campus. And for me it's been about three iterations, you know, just a few changes. But for many I'd say it's a lot more, but the gene maintains its integrity for a billion years, it's right on the end of your finger, just look at it. There is a God, and there are no coincidences. That's the best rule. And in politics, that is the best rule. There are no coincidences. So when I got the phone call from the president on the 22nd of December, December yeah, three days before Christmas, and he and Giuliani asked me if I would uh, 
take some decisions that would allow them to get rid of the electors from my state and install his electors. And I said, Mr. President, I voted for you, I walked for you, I campaigned for you, I was on the dang stage with you, but I will do nothing illegal for you. He said, well, we don't think it's illegal. I mean, here there's a law that allows a legislature. What's the, what's the term? That theory of, of the independent legislative. And, and, well, the independent state legislature. And, it, and it's in Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2 or 3. And it, they cite the, the decision of Richard Nixon in the Hawaii case in 1960, when there was a very close election in Hawaii. The, the winner was a Republican. Uh, by the Nixon won for like, it was like 70 votes in the whole state. And so it triggered the automatic election. But the timeline, the states have the authority to choose the manner of the election of electors for the presidential election. The states have that manner exclusively. No one else gets to do it right in the Constitution. But the Congress has the timing. So they dictate when it has to happen. The states get to take, dictate how it happens. So all the rules about elections in a state are controlled by the state legislature. So while Rudy, he thought it was a state law, it's actually a federal statute, but it's only been tested in a, even close, by some extreme measure, is when Hawaii had 70-ish, and they sent off the electors because the electors had been decided timing-wise by the Congress. And it was like the day of. So he won, sent Nixon's electors to Washington. And then this but it triggered the recount. So when they recounted, Kennedy won by 178 votes. So they got another suite of electors and sent them to, to Washington. I don't know if it was people or names. I think it was people. But, who got to choose? Come on, you're poli sci. Who gets to cast the electors? Diane and something. He's what? The vice president. And who was the vice president in 1960? Richard Nixon, who was the candidate for presidency. Now, if you ever wanted a choice, if you ever wanted to be tricky dick, that was the time. But Nixon said no. Kennedy wins. And so they were saying, hey, you can do it. Just call everybody back in, change the rule. You have exclusive dominion over the rules of elections. Do that. And I'm saying, Mr. Giuliani, it was a much more compressed conversation. I said, he said, you have 14,000 dead people. No. Yeah, 14,000 dead people voted in Arizona. And 6,000 stolen military ballots were cast in Arizona. And 200,000 illegal uh, residents were voted in Arizona. And other uh, very large numbers of people. And that certainly covers the 10,457 vote difference between Biden and, uh, and Mr. Trump. And I said, have you got their names? Do you have the names of these people? And he said, yes. I said, and the president pipes up. Give him what he wants, Rudy, give him what he wants. It's kind of a good cop, bad cop thing. And, and I said, you can put those on my head, on my desk? He said, yes, you can bring them. I said, because you're going to need to. I've never heard of any such, you know, any such stretch of the law as what you're proposing, and I will do nothing illegal, and I have some very good lawyers, and I'm thinking, you're a lawyer, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so he said, I will. I'll send, I'll get you the information. I said, well, I, Mr. President, I'm not good with this iPhone. I, I can't even tweet. And he kind of chuckled and I said, but I'm going to try to punch the number of my lawyer and, and give it to you right now so we've got it all cleared up. But watch, it'll be me telling my grandkids and some students of you that I hung up on the President of the United States. And that's exactly what I did. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 but, 
So Rudy calls him right back and he says, he's laughing, he's like, that, that's, that's pretty funny. I said, actually, I think it is pretty funny. But this isn't very funny. And Rudy, I want the proof. You asking me to do this, I better have the proof, and it better be damn good proof. And he said, I'll give it right to you. Guess what? Never got anything. Never got a thing. I shouldn't say that. Seven months later, Boris Epstein of the President's legal group in the White House called because Mr. Fincham, the, his erstwhile work, if you tried and you missed something, the erstwhile Secretary of State in Arizona and ran for office and he did not win. And I hope I was helpful in that outcome as a fellow Republican. <laughs> so, and, but he had introduced a bill that allowed the people, it's a referendum, to refer to the ballot, the people can vote on whether they will continue the results of the 2020 election. 2020. This was 2021-ish. Two. And, and, uh, and I wouldn't hear it. And so Boris is calling, so this is 2021. Boris is calling saying, I want you to hear that bill. And I said, I'm not going to hear the bill. He says, why not? You've given it to the people. You don't have to vote. I said, I'm not going to take a hike. I'm not button anything. That's my responsibility. I'm not going to give it to the people. And I'm not going to be part of the circus. You know, get used to it. Trump lost this election. He didn't get cheated. He lost. And I'll tell you how. And he said, anyone, he pivoted, 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 and it ended up, I just said, Boris, I'm not going to do it. And by the way, Boris, you guys have all promised to send me the proof. Will you send me the proof? Oh, yeah, I'll call, I'll call Fincher. You ratted out Fincher. I'll call Fincher and get him to do it. Because Fincher can also die. And, and so, four days later, I found the proof. The proof was brought to me. It was an inch thick, sat on my desk, not with no provenance. There was, it was mysterious. It came floating down the hall and landed on my desk. It had a term paper from Mr. Fincher on this concept, the independent expenditure. It had two papers by Mr. Featherson. No, it's wrong. John Eastman. Eastman, the, the counsel for the president, saying, you know, this is an idea that you could push. It had a Nadelson, Bob Nadelson University of Montana, brilliant guy, former candidate in those politics, talked to him for hours, talked to John Eastman for hours, talked to Schuster for hours, talked to other lawyers around the state, or the country, to get the background on this concept. And why would they think this? And all of them came out there, yeah, it's never been years, but I said, and you're gonna, and you're asking me to put my state through this just because you think I should try it and let the courts decide? That's my job. No, that's not my job. My job is to decide. You want to sue me on the decision? Yours. Go for it. But so upshot was it had then those three, four things, and a hundred tear sheets from a county somewhere that showed the sign-in and the sign-out of ballot groupings, 200 ballots. There's a sheet that goes with each group, sign the last movement. It moved from Precinct X to Voting Center Y for county. Signed in, MCSO, Sheriff's Officer, witnessing, signed out. And this one was when they signed into the building, there were signatures missing on the bottom. Of, and there was 100 sheets, there was 90 things. And I showed them, I took them right to the back, to the, the county recorder and said, yeah, those are tear sheets, those are, those are rooting sheets, basically, to follow the ballots. And he said, it was a Sunday, you can see it right there, that's a Sunday. We didn't have enough people to sign all of these things, and so they were just signing what they could as they came through, and they missed them. It doesn't mean 200 ballots exited the side door into the dumpster, etc. So, anyhow, I wanted to back up on Mr. Trump. We noticed, and I was a Trump guy. I didn't like him. I thought he was boorish, that he was uncivil. And, but he put, the, the reason I voted was the five, the, the Supreme Court. And he helped 
in a lot of ways in the regulation of all types of agencies. I, I tried to get as much info as I could. And they said, it's streamlining, it's more efficient, things are better. We remember pre-COVID, employment, all kinds of other things. The trains ran on time in Germany. And but it was better. I, I said, okay, I'm on. But now it was crunch time. Now it was, we want you to give us an edge. And, and I didn't know exactly why it was done. First, why did he lose? 10,457. We noticed in the first election that there was a group of people that did not vote for Mr. Trump, that voted Republican. Women, educated, mostly employed, two to three small children, did not vote for Mr. Trump. Why do you think that is? Any women want to hazard? Well, maybe you're all sports. It don't matter, it doesn't matter. But they couldn't show their kids the TV with an F-bombing president. They couldn't say, I want you to grow up to be like the president to their kids. And they just said, I can't stand that guy. How he treats people, especially how he treats women. And we're just not going to vote for him. So we said, we're going to need that vote. We have some very wonderful, professional, smart, educated colleagues in our ranks. We're going to highlight those with our advertising in Arizona. And we did. And we started to know by the polling. Taking backwards. We were gaining, we were gaining, we were making inroads. People said, okay, I'll hold my nose and I'll and I'll do it. Of this, of this group, this demographic. Until how many days early can you vote in Arizona? And many have early voted. 28 days. But it was in that gap, and you can write it, you know, get your ballot, send it in up to 20 days before. In that gap of time, two events happened nationally. Same event. The debates. And if you remember the first debate between Mr. Trump and Mr. Biden, just what was your impression? Now, I'm trying to get these women and juvenile, childish, it, it, was, it was horrible. And at the end of it, I looked at Donetta and I said, he just lost the election. We will not keep those women because they have the ballots in their hands. And when we review the ballots, no names, but we see this interesting group, no vote for president, all Republican. Or Biden, all Republican. 60,000 no votes, 18,000 plus, Biden with all Republican, and was saying, I, I wonder who that group of people is. And that's where he lost the election. Nobody stole that election, he lost that election. And so, now fast forward, we got the proof, the, the uh, whatever. <laughs> but up to this time, have not seen it, done it. The people start showing up at the house. I don't know. John had a long time to call the wife to cry on the phone. But there were, it was like nine times, it wasn't every day, but it's got to be kind of a regularity of these larger trucks. All of you guys like big trucks, sorry when I see you, I think. Is he gonna run over me? Did he see me? And, and with the flags and the air horns and the MRAPs and this thing that this military looking vehicle with big loudspeakers going through my neighborhood. Bowers is a pedophile, he's a corrupt politician, he's your neighbor, what are you doing? You have a neighbor like that. And then all the, uh, they started a, a recall campaign against me and uh, they were doing well. They blankly spent 150000 ish dollars getting volunteers to go to her tour and through the parking lots and people coming and said, what's the some guy talked to me at Costco? What an idiot. He said this, this, and this about you. I said, I know, I've got a large fan base. And, and, he, and they said, well, I, I can't tell you what I told him, but I wasn't very kind, and, and he went back and got his car, and etc. And that was successful. 
for what they wanted to do ultimately. But in the recall election, we had had a recall where Russell Pierce had been recalled and they wanted some changes in the laws. And one of the laws was that if it's a recall election versus a regular election, and no offense, a lot of people don't pay attention. They don't want to hear some petition. What day of the year is it? Is it the year of the vote? And, but in a recall, they said, you've got to have a slip on every sheet, state slip that says, this is a recall of X. Has to explain it very carefully. So when they showed up, they got 24,000 signatures. And in, the, and in the middle of this, I've got, you know, we put out our, we were the first in the nation. And I, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to lobby you to send out a press release. But it got so bad that I said, you've got to do a presser and put out a, a, some type of a release. And we explained that we'd had this rather breathless request that we uh, exchange the electors. And in the absence of any proof that we could find, we weren't going to do it. There's no proof. And of course, it was like the Atlas Fives going off, you know. The proof is obvious. Did you see how many people were at the campaign rally? And how many people went to his? I mean, he was at a, like, at a, a Sinclair gas station. He couldn't get people at the pumps, you know. And yet, 70,000 people at Trump's, it's obvious somebody cheated. I said, it's kind of like the Rolling Stones. Hey, did you go to the concert in New York? No, I was in Frisco. But then, hey, let's meet in Washington. He's like that. Same 70,000 going around the state at these big rallies. And the Democrats, ground game. And if you haven't read it, Time Magazine, something about how we saved the 2020 election. Excellent layout. Got in trouble for telling them. But they just laid out, here's what the Democrats did. And it was a very, you know, we got the sucker bucks and we got 400,000 of our funds and we did this, 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 and this. And it worked for them. Because their ground game offset the, the, the Rolling Stones show, and they were able to bring more people out. 